Welcome to the London is Blue podcast, or should I say, Bienvenue chez le podcast London is Blue, because we are going full francophone today to discuss the latest Frenchman to step through the Stamford Bridge doors. I should just say, no, this isn't Dan's best British accent. He's thrown up the bat signal. He's handed the keys to the Dan and Sam podcast to me, Oli Glanville, and I'm joined, as ever, by the esteemed Sam, CFC Central. So, Sam, uh, how are you feeling after the tour? Um, hey, Oli, uh, I am absolutely reeling under the worst case of um, jet lag that, that I've experienced in my life. It just been a topsy-turvy couple of days. I've been sleeping at like 10 in the evening and then waking up at like 4.30 in the morning. Um, I almost slept off before the podcast, just uh, giving out a fair warning in case I slur my words or end up pronouncing random players who aren't even like covered under the ambit of this podcast. But other than that, I think just the good kind of exhaustion, you know, getting to see people up close and personal, getting to see Pochettino's work um, as close as I could get to it. It was it was quite fantastic uh, to to be able to, you know, put um, sort of a name to to the efforts that we'd heard of in terms of what Pochettino brings. So I think overall it was a it was a fantastic experience, something that I was privileged enough to see and very very grateful for. Great, and yeah, we obviously we hope you recovered enough to to get on this pod <laughs> and do your best. But uh, also, how are you feeling about this burgeoning French core? We've now obviously got. Uh, and Kunku is leading that effort. Uh, we've already got Wes Fafana, Benoit Badishil, uh, you know, and now we have Axel Di Sassi and uh, Leslie Ugachukwu, and obviously the brilliant Malagusto who uh, has finally joined us. I think it's uh, pretty incredible. It feels kind of when Michael Emanalo um, and a couple of our guys who were working in the recruitment department back, you know, almost a decade, recognizing that Belgium was going to be the next Brazil trying to get the the young talents in through the door. So it, it just feels like everybody knew that Ligue 1 and, and the kind of talents coming out of there are exceptional. But the volume in which we are signing them and uh, recognizing which ones we need and getting them through the door very, very quickly just feels like we have our fingers on the pulse. We're getting the creme de la creme. Um, uh, French word, just adding it through. Um, and I would say that the, the, the team looks just, uh, in terms of the je ne sais quoi that we wanted, I think uh, we've got the right kind of people in. So, yeah, I, I hope you're happy with my French. Oli, I'm trying my best. Yeah, magnifique. Um, to be honest, uh, I, I think you touched on a load of points that is a nice segue. Um, with You know, this is a continued nurturing of this blos- blossoming partnership. Uh there are two more highly uh, promising French players that are obviously uh, joining the Blues uh, and do play for Le Bleu. Um, and yeah, it's the 25-year-old uh, centre-back, Axel Di Sassi, as we've already touched upon. Um, he's joining in a deal uh, worth 45 million euros, so it's around 38 million pounds, uh, just in time to reinforce this injury hit uh, kind of centre-back crisis we have at the moment in our centre-back department. Uh, a place where we looked like we were quite well set going into the season. And he could potentially, you know, look to stake a claim for Wesley's, Wesley Fofana's place in the squad. But also we have an ageing Thiago Silva as well. So there's a lot of sort of uncertainty around that heading into the season and into next season especially. Then there's the 19-year-old Leslie Ugachukwu, who we'll come on to, uh, we bought from Stade René or Ren, And uh, he's one of sort of the next cab off the rank from that brilliant academy. You can think of people like Kamavinga who have come through there in, in a previous iteration. So it's a real uh, star factory there, uh, if you like. And he's joining us for around 27 million euros or around 23 million pounds. So what can Chelsea fans uh, look forward to with both these sorts of players? Um, that's what we're going to be looking at going through in this pod. So as ever, uh, London is Blue exists thanks to you, you know, the amazing community that you've built here uh, and of Chelsea supporters. And we can't thank you enough for your support. Um, as a reminder, the best way as ever to support the show and join the amazing community of Chelsea supporters is through Patreon at patreon.com slash London is Blue pod. However, there are plenty of free ways to support the pod. 
um, which includes su subscribing to the show via Apple Podcast and Spotify and leaving that five-star review. And that helps other listeners find the pod. Um, in addition, we have uh, our YouTube channel as well. You can join us on YouTube to see the show and help us to push uh, for 25K. And at the moment, we're just over 23. And if just 10% of those who listen to the show joined as well, we could pass that goal. So again, it costs nothing to subscribe and helps us as an independent source of Chelsea news and content com to compete with the legacy offerings and those kind of big beast media outlets. So moving on, uh, first through the door uh, this morning, as we as we record, uh, or rather last night even when he arrived to uh, do his medical, um, Axel de Sassine. So let's first start with what uh, he had to say on joining Chelsea. So he said, I'm so happy to be here at this big club. I'm really proud to be able to be part of this great family and I hope to achieve very big things here, to win titles. I will do everything I can to achieve these objectives. I am very ambitious. And we also got comments from uh, co-sporting directors, uh, Stuart and Wynne Stanley. He's, they said uh, Axel has showcased his quality over several seasons in France, and that has deservedly led to recognition on the international stage. He is ready to take the next step in his career, and we are delighted that we will be, he will be with Chelsea. We will welcome him into the club, and look forward to him joining up with Mauricio Prochettino and his new teammates in the days ahead. So with that in mind, Sam, uh, first and foremost, foremost, rather, first and foremost, Axel's a, a leader for club and country, right? He's this kind of born leader almost. He's grown as this leadership role, especially in the absence of one Benoit Badiashil, who joined us um, last summer, or last January, rather. And um, yeah, he's he's got the captain's armband at club level, also through youth, youth national team level as well, through to seniors. And, you know, several of our young French contingent know him well at club level and national team level. Do you think that's going to accelerate his integration at the club? No, absolutely. I think you're 100% right in terms of, I think he's had an interesting trajectory. Um, we actually covered this Aussie about... Um, I would say a year and a half ago when we were looking at centre-backs, uh, this was about the time when uh, we hadn't signed Wesley Fofana. So we had about six centre-backs that we did like two megapods on and Josco Guardiol was in it as well. And we had Paddy Ashil also on the pod. Um, and then Dizazi was so, probably, I would say, around fourth or fifth on that list. And uh, he was promising back then, like you said, it was... His, his talent was already apparent. He was elder to the other candidates on the list. He had had accumulated a fair bit of experience. And uh, after that, we managed to pluck Badia Shield away from Monaco. And um, they just basically plunged after that. I think they had a very tumultuous season. Last season, their league position wasn't anywhere close to what it should have been. So I think they've had a tough time. And uh, in, in the middle of all of that, just like what happened to us. I think Dizazi being one of the leaders in the group has had to hold that fort together. And then he's gone through those tough times and he's had to be uh, in a relatively inexperienced team, had to be the voice of reason, somebody who's had to take a lot of flack. And I think that only serves to strengthen you. So um, we're getting somebody who's not just had a very linear kind of growth. He's had his ups and downs. Um, he's gone through the lows that we have the past year. So getting into a dressing room, which is sort of on the up, gives him an opportunity. And he's also got some great people that he already recognizes. I mean, he's mentioned that in the interviews, saying that obviously he knows Badia Shil, he also knows Fafana, he also knows Gusto and Thiago Silva, who he's played against. So I think coming into that environment, like you said, a very francophone feel to it, like our pod today, um, only serves to sort of make us stronger. And I think, uh, you know, it's it's a move that benefits both parties very, very well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and as you said, you know, we've spoken at length about this RC over the last few years, um, and particularly in regards to Benoit, uh, when it was clear that we were targeting him at Monaco as well. How do you think the two are similar and what marks them apart? I think you've, you've put it very nicely, like in, in terms of, I think when you think of, classic battering rams in the air. You would think of Dizazi as being somebody who's who's definitely in there. Uh, but he's not just the old-fashioned guy who will win you everything in the air. I think he's 
Um, interesting in the sense that he's also got a great radar in terms of his passing, uh, his some of his passing, the range of his passing, um, how open and how adventurous he was with picking passes in between lines, almost, you know, like a very adventurous central midfielder who wanted to pick options all the time, even if it meant losing the ball. It just felt like um, he's he's definitely honed that over the last couple of years. So um, compared to Badia Shiel, I think they're quite similar, to be honest. I, I think both of them have this aerial aura about them, like you can't get beyond them when you throw something in the air. Both of them have line-breaking passes. Both of them are adept in a high line, which they've played in Monaco together. So there is definitely synergy there. I think Badia Shiel obviously... I think is a little more accomplished on the ground. Somebody who's much, much better 1v1 and, and able to sort of defend in wide positions. Dizazi, I would say, still has room to improve over there. Um, we got the better Monaco centre-back first. I think that'll be fair to say. But um, yeah, Dizazi also brings a lot of leadership, which I think Bhatia Shield does not have. Uh, he's, he's somebody who's shy, somebody who's extremely quiet. Uh, Benoit's brother himself said, you know, you need to be more vocal. You have to be a killer. And I think that's something that Dizazi has that, that um, you know, Badia Shield doesn't. So it's a complimentary pair. I think both of them enjoy playing together and uh, hopefully they'll feed off each other and uh, make each other better. I think that just serves to make us better as a unit. What about you? Like, do you think uh, there are some major differences in terms of how they compare? Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, to me, Benoit is far more of a kind of traditional centre-back in the sense that he really relishes ground jewels and his passing out from the back is more akin to a kind of Colwell type where um, he'll tend to progress by passing rather than dribbling with the ball. Whereas Adisasi, I feel, really loves to... Uh, encourage himself to do progressive carries and it's I think it's no coincidence that he started life as a as a striker right and moved backwards um we have all this versatility with Axel um you know he's played left back center back uh all across the three in terms of a three-man back uh back line and then obviously right back for the national team as well with that whole one minute he got in the uh world cup final there in the 120th minute um when he replaced uh Kunde. But yeah, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Um to me, Axel is like a big man uh profile. Like if you think of like a zoomer almost, um, who's he, they really relish those aerial duels, um, but they tend to try and nip in front of of attackers and and pos- position themselves in the best possible way to try and uh, intercept rather than get involved in that kind of 1v1 battle. And when they do get involved, they tend to want to end it quickly by sliding in or, or bumping a player off the ball. Um, do you think that's a fair characterization? Yeah, I think that's very accurate. I was trying to find out the French word for bravo, but I think that's exactly it, bravo. Um, that, that's pretty accurate, I would say. I think um, both of them have shown in terms of their dueling prowess you know, like you mentioned, I, they have an affinity for the duel. I would say Dizazi is a little um, different in the sense he behaves differently depending on where he is on the pitch. Uh, a little bit compared to Badi Shield, who's a little more refined, a little more consistent. But uh, other than that, I think Zuma is a good comparison. Um, I have another comparison to make, but I think I will do that because one of our listeners asked that question. And I think I'll... Uh, I'll make that comparison maybe somewhere um, after, you know, after we get to the listener questions. That makes sense. Yeah. So uh, when we come back, we'll have more on Axel. But first, a uh, message from our sponsors. So, yeah, we'll get into the audience questions now, as, as you uh, rightly highlighted. So we've got a question here from uh, Obviously CFC on Twitter. Uh, it says, how does this RC compare to Chalaba? So Trevor Chalaba, um, which player, past or present, do you feel he's most similar to? Do you want to take that, Sam? Mm. Well, I think uh, it's it's a bit of a sideways move for me. I think when you look at Chalaba, I don't see Dizasi as a as a clear upgrade on Chalaba, to be honest. I, I do feel like both of them uh, have their strengths, but both of them also have very clearly defined weaknesses. So um, if you wanted to find somebody to be that right centre-back, um, 
and somebody to be a clear upgrade. Obviously, we would have paid a lot more money, but it does look like we've found somebody to be able to compete uh, with Wesley Fofana once he's fit again. And also maybe cover Reese James and Malo Gusto, both of whom have, have sort of like gone through their own injury worries recently. So I think the club just found that profile to be very, very um, valuable. And I would say Pochettino's preseason has also shown that he likes a right back who can slot in as a right centre back. And I think uh, when you look at the Sasi, he sort of ticks every single box there. So if you can get somebody for a 45 million uh, who's experienced, who's not as young as some of the other guys that we bought in, uh, it just makes sense to to sort of like get him in. I, I Again, I, I would stress that Chalaba should have been given a chance. Uh, I He might still feature in the plans. I mean, I, I do not know if um, Thiago Silva, how he features in, in the entire picture. I would say that, you know, maybe there, there should have been Chalaba getting that chance. But um, in terms of, I think just differences, the aerial thing stands out 100%. I feel like Chalaba is good in the air, but Tassasi is very, very good in the air. And I, I do feel like Chalaba has certain moments where his concentration wanes. And there are times when he sort of just blanks out and doesn't make the decision that he should. Like most world-class centre-backs tend to make basic decisions well 100% amount of the times. And I think Chalaba sort of like, fluffs those lines a little bit sometimes, but again, he's young. Um, this ass, he seems to be a lot more focused. I think he's he's able to repeat those actions over and over again without making mistakes that stand out. So I think that's the basic difference. But um, yeah, I think in terms of past and present, we had a similar question, uh, like I mentioned, from the audience saying, uh, who is, it was the comparison from James 91027. Um I would say he he reminds me a lot of Van Dyke. You know, he he is somebody who's interestingly not um, very aggressive when he's in his own half, when he's in his own defensive third, he will stand off. Um, he tries to make sure that he's reacting rather than being proactive. He waits for the attacker to make a decision and then he responds to it. He's able to read intentions very well. And I think that's something that Van Dyke does as well. Uh, in that dominant season, in his in his first second season at, at Liverpool, we saw how how good he was one v one, how reliant he was in terms of just being the spine of the team, being able to be the last man, and and being that rock that you could just leave the entire defense on and not have to worry about. Uh, Dzazi isn't quite there, but uh, he reads the game the same way. I think he anticipates it. He makes decisions the same way. So I think. Uh, Van Dyke light would be an accurate version in terms of like describing him. Um, he's, he's definitely like th- those were the feels that I was getting when I was watching him. Yeah, I mean, it, I think that's a that's a fair comparison, absolutely. So what you're saying is we'll have a a Levi Colwell who's essentially a left-footed Van Dyke and a and a Axel <laughs> which is a right-footed Van Dyke. Is that, is that what you're you're going with? I think that's that's very accurate because when I was uh, watching the last game um, against Dortmund, it just um, there were some moments where we were a little too open for Dortmund, and the one guy who was just sitting behind and saying "Let me have it" was Levi. It just felt like he enjoyed that challenge, and and it he didn't look flustered at all. And Obviously, when Van Dyke was at the peak of his powers, that's something that they did all the time. You obviously had the entire defense. Um, Trent Alexander Arnold not including you had Van Dyke and then after that you had to get through Allison. So um, if you've got a defense that has three layers of security, then um, you obviously can have and take those liberties. And I think when you've got somebody like a Colville and the Sassi, uh, the balance might be a bit off sometimes because both like standing off, especially because we've seen Colville in a back three, I would say for Brighton. Um, but in a back four, his role might change a little bit, I think. So uh, how are they going to behave in a back four? Who sort of is the more aggressive centre-back? Who stands off? Um, is our goalkeeper anywhere close to Alisson? Again, those questions are, are definitely ones that you can ask. But um, yeah, I think getting those two centre-backs to, who are happy being the last man in defence, I think it's an asset in one way, but it can also be a liability in others. Yeah, I mean, you touched on it. Also, uh, we had a couple of listener questions on his behavior around 
uh, being the last man back, Axel de is. Um, so we have a question from uh, Smash That Flop on Twitter. It says, um, Axel de Sassi one-on-one with strikers or his recovery pace. We also had a question um, from Offa Lamin about uh, his speed. Um, do you think his speed is an issue going back? So interestingly, this is something that has been pointed out a lot, saying that maybe he's, you know, the French Maguire, which has been thrown about a lot on Twitter. But uh, to be honest, I, I think that he's he's not that slow. And I, and I would say he's not that quick either. So he's not on the upper spectrum where I would say if you watched Zuma uh, before his ACL injury, go back and make recovery tackles, how quickly he ate up ground. Dezassi is not quite there. But he's also not Maguire. He's not slow off the, you know, off the bat. He's still got a good short burst. Um, and what helps him is, like we mentioned, he's usually a guy who's retreating in defense. He's usually wanting to be the last man. So he's trying to sweep up threats. So he doesn't really have to run 40 yards back. He's usually already backpedaling. He's reading the game as he's going back just to make sure that his center backs have a fail safe. So... Um, you know, in a high line that Monaco play often, there are obviously times when he steps up and it's hard for him to to sort of like move because, again, if you look at his size, if you look at his bulk, it is tough for a big man like him to to be running at full speed and then comparing against somebody like an Eliawahi or, a, or an Mbappe. So those situations will arise 100%, but he's definitely not slow. I think he... He's had performances that I've watched against Mbappe where he was comfortable. He was able to defend wide. He was able to put in good tackles, time them well. Um, So not too many issues, but I would say that the weaknesses that I've seen are when he tends to be a little more aggressive and tries to step up and then, you know, he's completely eliminated because he's just too far up the pitch. So might have to adapt a little bit, but um, if he plays the role that he's supposed to do as the sweeper or the the cover center back, then I think he should be absolutely good. If there are like smaller spaces to cover, he should be fine. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think part of the reason why people see him as slow on the eye test is because he's just so big. <laughs> yeah, look at the stride length. I mean, it, it, people don't tend to clock like the dude is taking long strides. So obviously, he's taking them slower, but he's also moving that quickly. I mean, it's it's hard to fathom. Um, but yeah, there were some recovery sprints, which I like recorded and, and logged and made sure that I watched it over and over again. And then he kept pace. It didn't look like he was being, you know, gassed out or it didn't look like he was struggling to keep pace. He makes it look like he's absolutely fine running backwards. So like you mentioned, um, a little deceptive on the eye, but, um, I think he'll, he'll be fine. Yeah, one last thing I, you probably want to touch on, and I'm sure it came up in the in the scouting report, is his goal threat, right? Um, this is a player who's, I think, scored 12 goals at Monaco in the last three seasons, um, been involved in more goal involvements just uh, in terms of his assists um, and playing uh, at right back or, um, you know, crossing or heading on uh, set pieces. Uh, part of what we were saying about his, his pace or perceived lack of pace um, he is dangerous going forward. He's got a shot on him and he is a very clear set piece threat. I mean, almost every Monaco set piece is aiming at Axel de Sassi. So yeah, what, what are your opinions on him in terms of a goal threat? Yeah, absolutely. He's uh, somebody who's your first line of reference when you're going for corners from either side. Loves an outswinger on his forehead and uh, I mean, we talked about how good he is aerially, but his leap is excellent his timing of the header is superb. Uh, he's also physically robust, so you can't really stop him once he gets going. You know, he's he's very, very committed to getting his head on the ball. I've also seen him attempt a bicycle kick. I've also seen him uh, chest a corner at the edge of the box and smack it with his wrong foot. So he's also got that in his locker. Um, so definitely a goal threat in the other box. And I've seen him defend set pieces as well. And, and he's very, very good. He just reads the trajectory of the ball very well. He's a strong marker. He's usually very focused. He knows exactly where he needs to be positioning wise in terms of reading intentions. Very, very good. So it's something that he referenced in his opening interview with us um, on the fifth stand as well. It's just somebody that likes to be in those physical duels. So inside the box, it's, it's something that he wants to be either box. 
And like you mentioned, if we can add at least five goals from set pieces uh, with this RC, I mean, that would be a massive, massive step towards, you know, bettering our abysmal goal tally from last season. That would be like, what, one-sixth of the goals that we scored in the entire Premier League season last season. So um, that just goes to say, you know, if the club is also looking at trying to, to better those tallies. So if we can get that out of him, huge bonus. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think five would make him maybe second or third top scorer in the league last season for us. So <laughs> that kind of puts you in mind of how bottomed out the uh, the scoring charts were last season. But as you say, yeah, a mag- uh, kind of ball magnet in both boxes. The ball always seems to just find him. But as you say, strategically, he is placed in order to either clear it or um, be that goal threat at the other end. I think that's a nice balanced view of uh, Axa de Sassi for our, our listeners. Um, when we come back, we'll have more on our other French signing, this uh, fantastic young prospect, Leslie Ugachukui. But first, here's another message from our sponsors. So, uh, yes, the, this other kind of name out the blue, which, um, you know, a lot of the people who, who, who've who been watching the uh, Academy at Ren have, have been talking about for a few years now. Um, he's kind of a star of the uh, Ren Academy, just as uh, Kamavinga was before him. Um, Leslie Ugachukwu. Uh, it, it, the kind of Ornstein Bombazzo when it came out um, that we'd agreed a fee for him and the, that he was actually flying in overnight and then he joined us out in the States. It was all kind of a uh, very uh, quick uh, turnaround, which was which was nice to see in terms of uh, buying in midfielders. Yeah, it, when he came in, Pochettino said uh, that he would uh, join him on tour and that he would have that assessment there. I think we've all seen the uh, TikTok where he uh, nutmegs Conor Gallagher with the kind of nice back hill roulette there and with uh, Nkuku's reaction, which is nice. Uh, when he joined the co-sporting directors, uh, Stuart Wynn Stanley said that they were delighted Leslie is joining Chelsea. He's an impressive young player who has already made his mark in Ligue 1. He has a huge amount of potential and we know he's going to continue to develop and improve. We are pleased that he is has joined us in the US and that he will be able to integrate with the squad quickly. So yeah, it, there was a bit of uncertainty about uh, why he was joining with a couple of uh, days to go. It was too quick a turnaround uh, for him to get any minutes against Borussia Dortmund, sadly. But given the state of the pitch, as Nick uh, <laughs> will regale you with, it was uh, probably best that he didn't uh, come on when he wasn't completely fully fit. So yeah, um, moving on to the player. Uh, what were your first reactions uh, with him joining Sam? Yeah, that's a tough one because I had sort of seen him sparingly at uh, Ren. Obviously, I was keeping uh, an eye on a couple of talents from there. The other one being Desiree Duet, who was also absolutely fantastic. And uh, both these guys were apparently sort of given the green light to move because of, I don't know, financial troubles. Uh, at the club and, and you know, being able to sell those big assets for big money, I think that was what was going to happen. So uh, it did come out of the blue. Like you said, on-scene bombas usually come out of the blue. And um, we were pleasantly surprised. I think somebody who's um, not expecting any midfield signing for the next decade or so, it was it was nice to actually hear that a central midfield had come in. Um, and uh, it, it's interesting. I think the best way that I can sum it is is actually a some uh, like an opinion I read on Twitter from a friend Sabrina. Uh, you can find it at Stuff Sap says. So she said um, that basically Ugo Chukwu was Zulavia or Ugarte or Onana a year before they became fifty million players, and I think that's a fantastic way of putting it. Um, when I've seen him play, it's very apparent that this guy has technical and physical fundamentals to to turn him into a world beater you know it, it it genuinely is scary in terms of how good he can be it's just uh we've bought him on the basis of potential the 27 million we've paid um is for a player who's you know it's just buying a very high grade quality of of play it's just trusting the potters um at our club uh after Graham Potter, ironically, uh, to to sort of mold him into the kind of player that he can be. You know, it, it's um, gambling on potential, but um, 
from what we've heard in terms of other scouts from Premier League clubs saying that he's, you know, got the potential to be a world beater if he continues his trajectory very, very well. So I think we've just identified the Moises Caicedo before he even became a 60 million player. And uh, the ideal pathway would be to give him the opportunity to ease in, continue his development, and then come back in a year, year and a half, ready to challenge and show what he has arguably next preseason. Yeah, I think that's completely fair as a characterization. It's definitely a kind of a gamble on that potential. But it, given his potential is, is so high, uh, it definitely seems like uh, a gamble worth uh, taking. Um, to me, he's um, kind of stylistically quite similar to a, a Rubin or a Cassade in terms of his his dribbling capability. Definitely that kind of um, good feet for a big man uh, kind of stereotype that we have in football. Um, he, the way he kind of drifts in possession uh, is it's so tough to stop. And given his his height and build, um, it's incredibly impressive to watch as well. Um, but what are the areas that you think he really excels at? So I am in a bit of a flux here, Oli. So I, I will rely on your opinion very strongly here because um, a lot of guys who I know and whose opinion I respect in terms of league on have, have told me that he's a phenomenal talent. You know, he's he's got everything which I can, I can definitely see when I watched him play. But... Um, I would say, like you mentioned, he's he's definitely got some shades of the tall guy who can stride through any line and then basically like carry the ball towards dangerous areas. So he's definitely got shades of Ruben. But I think when I'm looking at him, I can I can see him turn into a Yaya Toure, or I can see him turn into a, a Yusuf Fofana. It's just there is either there or there, and it's up to him in terms of how and where he's going to reach. So I think in terms of his abilities, he's also mentioned that he's trained in different positions. Um, he's started off as a box-to-box midfielder, somebody with the ability to go up and down, which you know is, is sort of like a reference for him. Two of the players that he's been compared to and he admires are Patrick Vieira and Paul Pogba. Uh, he isn't quite there yet, but in terms of dynamism, in terms of being able to offer things all across the pitch between both boxes, I can definitely see that potential being there. So um, all action has multiple skill sets. He's a jack of all trades, I would say. He, he's he got certain spikes in terms of, yes, some games he performs very well defensively. And now he at, at Ren, he's playing as a number six. So he's also playing at that as that defensive midfielder who's giving other players the chance to go and and do their things while he's winning the ball closer to his goal, uh, short carries, short passes, and giving other people the chance to express themselves. So he's learning on the fly. He's learning new positions. He's like He mentioned that he's getting comfortable at uh, DM at number six. So I think he's still at the infancy of his education. But I would say his skill set is sort of well-rounded, but nothing stands out to a point where I would say that's world-class. You know, I, I think there's glimmer and, and sort of like luster everywhere, but um, it's just, it's difficult for me to say that, wow, this is going to be the player that everybody says he's going to be. Yeah, I think that's completely fair. He's at the stage of his career, as you say. It's It feels kind of eerily similar to when uh, Obi Mikel joined, uh, you know, when uh, us and United fought over him at the age of 16 or so. And he came off the back of that amazing tournament where Leo Messi got the golden ball and he got the silver ball at the under uh, 17 World Cup, under 20 World Cup. He's in that kind of middle ground where he's learned pretty much every midfield position. Uh, he even played some time at striker and uh, at, mm-hmm. at 10 as well. Um, but what's so encouraging to me is to see his development on the defensive side. He seems to really relish that side of it and that kind of physical battle, but also uh, knowing when to drop, knowing when to um, you know, be assertive and intercept. And I think if he is to make that full transition to be a, you know, a DM, a six, someone who isn't just box to box, but someone who you can rely on tactically to fill a void, say, next to an Enzo, that's really encouraging in terms of that profile. But as you say, I think he's got a lot of things to work on. 
Um, I mean, it's it's interesting, all isn't it? Because I mean, when you're 188 centimeters tall and you're in the center of the pitch, you stick out a leg and you, you know, end up accidentally tackling the linesman. I think he's he's just got that physical skill set in terms of um, when you see him move, like he's he's extremely quick across the ground. Again, somebody who's deceptively quick. Um, he's not, I would say, like an elite tackler in terms of his timing, but just he stands in front of you and there's nowhere to go. You know, there's 188 centimeters of long, spindly, spider-like legs just waiting to take the ball away from you. Lionel Messi has lost the ball to him. Al Neymar has lost the ball to him. It just looks like you're you're dribbling into a cul-de-sac, which I think makes him a very frightening proposition. A, a kind of thing that I would imagine would happen if you sort of came up against Prime Nemanja Matic. You wouldn't know where to go against a guy who could beat you stride for stride, uh, who could, you know, just completely shove you off like you were a housefly, you know, just, just coming to swat away. So it just it just feels like he could develop into something like that. Uh, I was reading the Athletic article and apparently the scout, uh, unnamed scout, Premier League top six scout who was quoted in the article said that he's also got room to fill out in terms of his frame. So he could still add the kind of muscle that we've seen Kani Chupomeka add to his frame. You know, we, he came back as a as a very um, nimble, sort of lean, wiry kid. And now he looks like he's just, you know, on, on Captain America sort of diet. So I think that could also end up pumping him to a different physical level. The kinds that we've seen from Leon Goretzka, for example. So um, lots of encouraging things, like you said. It's just a lot of it is two years down the line. Right now, it's just we're buying raw materials and it's just building it up to the optimal grade A a prototype of a central midfielder that we can over the next uh, two years. Yeah, I think that's a really fair characterization. Uh, We have a listening question uh, here that we'll come on to. uh, Fugan Karandar, Uh, he says, is it wise to keep him instead of going and getting an Alvarez or, you know, someone of that profile? Um, and how do these stats bear out in comparison to someone like an, uh, an Alvarez? So I guess you would put Sangare and, and people like that in that discussion. Uh, where do you think mm. he fits in terms of that? Um, it's a tough one. I mean, I might get criticism for what I'm going to express from a lot of um, Dutch football fanatics. But I would say that when you're playing as a central midfielder in the Dutch league, you're sort of playing on semi-pro difficulty. It just feels like uh, you've got a lot of room to do the right things and you aren't challenged enough to be able to to develop into the kind of midfielder that you want to be. There's a reason why nobody starts Sangare. Uh, he's been doing very well for almost two, two and a half years now. Um, there are a lot of other midfielders who are coming up. Matt Svifa is somebody that we've um, heard his name come up now that he's um, broken into the national team. So maybe like one of those two guys you're looking at and saying, why aren't we buying him? Why aren't we buying Edson Alvarez? Who's, you know, done well at the World Cup, who's doing well for an NT, who's doing well for, for Ajax for, for some time. So um, it just feels like it's it's unfair to compare leagues. I think Alvarez is again, uh, somebody who's a center back first and he's then converted into a central midfielder. So he ideally would, I mean, he fits the the role that, Mauricio Pochettino has asked his his central midfielders to do. We've seen Cassidy and Santos slot in as the third center back and build up. Uh, we've seen them defend uh, and, and make a back four into a back five by slotting in. And it's something that Alvarez is very, very comfortable doing because center back was his first trait. So when you look at the tactical fit, great. But you also have to look at just does he compare to the speed of the league and then does he adapt well there? And, and that's a massive question mark, I think, when when you're trying to make that adaptation from the Eredivisie to the Premier League. So um, I wouldn't go and spend 50 million, which is why I think 27 million have been earmarked for a younger talent with a higher ceiling, with a significantly higher ceiling, um, who could develop into a 70 million player if everything goes right. But um, the alternative would be to find somebody who's uh, making the transition from a more comparable league, from say from league, uh, uh, or even from the Portuguese league, which is uh, where we've seen good players come in and actually adapt very well in the Premier League. So um, I would be far more confident if a player came from those leagues and has shown consistently that he can cope with the speed there. 
I think, uh, would you agree with that assessment in terms of Alvarez and whether we should go for him as a Kaiseido alternative or what would your thought be in case we don't get to buy the Ecuadorian for 100 million? Yeah, I, I think the club are at a stage probably where they can't not get the Ecuadorian for 100 million. I think we've backed ourselves into the corner on that one. Um, in terms of the comparison of leagues, I do think it's really tough, as you said. Um, Ligue 1 for me feels m- players from there feel more physically ready for the Premier League. Um, as you say in the Eredivisie, the, they value uh, technicality far more than physicality, and that's part of the developmental side of the league and the kind of culture of Dutch football in general. Um, so to me, even though players like Sangare and, and Alfred really stand out there, it's noticeable that at a kind of higher tempo in terms of European games or against more physical opposition, often they struggle. Um, and that's, I think, just because of regular game time in a kind of Eredivisie style uh, game. Um, in terms of forecasting, as you were suggesting, you know, these, you know, one season, two seasons down the line where we have Leslie Ugachuk, where we have Cesare Cassade, we have we have Andre Santos, um, three really interesting young midfield profiles. How do you feel these three would fit alongside an Enzo? Because right now, Enzo is this cornerstone of our midfield. We literally, other than potentially Connor playing the pivot, which is a, a, a thing he's learning at the moment, if we're to flash forward, and just say we have these three young uh, midfielders, who do you think would fit best as a profile next to an Enzo? And that's, I think, the the million-dollar question right now, because those would be the contingency options, I think, in terms of if we don't get the Kaiser. That's the doomsday world. If we don't get him, where do we go? And I think the the obvious answer that we're looking at is... um, Obviously, it looks like Conor Gallagher, who's next to to Enzo, because that's where he's played most of preseason. But if you look at the younger players, I would say you have the luxury of having Andre Santos being extremely versatile. So you can, you know, put him as a right-sided option, complementing Enzo, being the more first-phase operator, being able to do the slotting into at center back and and being basically the kind of sitter role that he's played for the Brazilian youth sides, but you can also use him in the box to box role that he did at Vasco. You know, somebody who was very very happy to burst forward and and link up play and even pop up at the edge of the box or inside the box for headers or goals. Um, so you could ask him to do both roles, which I think is a very good asset to have from a young player. And I would keep him around for the exact same reason that he would be challenging for not one, but two slots. And and inevitably, there's going to be maybe a cup run, or hopefully that we can get into, and and there will be the chance to rotate and and give the likes of Santos the chance to to play that role. So I think you you would definitely benefit from keeping him around. Um, I would also see Kani Chukwomeka as somebody who might prove to be an interesting option um, as an Enzo backup, Not, not sort of like complimenting him, but as somebody who's um, just linking up play from deep, I think you and I have been sort of on the same page in terms of, is he now the best ball progressor in terms of the ball carrier mold after Rubens left, after Kovas left? Is he the best one at the club? And I think a lot of people would agree saying that he's got the ingredients there. So would he be able to do that role? And would would that be a challenge that pushes him to do Um, the kind of things that he's not able to do at this point in time. I think that's also an interesting challenge to have. Leslie, I think, is not ready. Um, From from the games that I've seen, I think he still needs at least one season. Uh, There are a lot of good things, but I think it's just worthwhile to give him 30 games of developing rather than giving him the odd game. And, And you're not going to be able to get the kind of attention that Pochettino has given players during preseason when the season's begun. So it just makes no sense for us to keep him and sort of stimmy his development. We did that with that for Fofana. And uh, unfortunately, he lost half a season because of it. We should have just put him on loan. Uh, but Breuer's injury also sort of threw a spanner in the works. So it just makes sense to, to take those decisions very quickly and say, yes, loan required. Come back next preseason. Train with the side. Iron out your mistakes and impress Pochettino. So... I would say that we've got good options for Enzo backup, but we don't have 
anything apart from Gallagher and perhaps Santos for the Enzo partner, which could be the way to go if we don't get Caicedo. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fair characterization. <laughs> Essentially, what we're saying is just get Caicedo. I think that's the, yeah. <laughs> that's the long and the short yeah, think, there, right? Absolutely, it just makes sense. I mean, it's it's a glaring hole. It's it's none of us can sort of agree with the fact that Gallagher is a starting right central midfielder. If you were to offer me that option as that 8-10 role that Pochettino has behind the striker, when Nkunku is maybe playing on the left or the right, then I would agree. Then you just put Gallagher in there and you'll see the kind of things that you've been seeing from him in preseason, 100%. But that right center midfield hole, you know, having a multi-phase central midfielder with the kind of industry and tactical know-how and the ability to do multiple roles at the same time, you need a specialist. You know, you definitely need a specialist. And and I think um, it's something that you've also talked about saying that you can't ignore a position that has been ignored for the past five, six years. You you can't compete. So hopefully we either make that decision now. Uh, I think they're still overpaying for Kaiser. A hundred million is probably 30 million more than, than what his market price is. But like you said, backed into a corner and um, have to have to finance Brighton's summer spending spree again. Yeah, maybe it'll be 25 million more than his value or uh, one Robert Sanchez. We'll have to wait and see. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I think we, we should probably end on a, on a positive note here. Um, just flashing forward um, maybe to the end of this season, where do you think we want these two players to be. So if we think of Axel de Sassi, um, is it enough for him to be the, you know, undisputed right centre-back um, at Chelsea? And is that a great thing for us? Um, and for Leslie, is it just a case of we really want him to continue his development, if, if that's here or on loan? Where would you want them to be at this stage next season? Yeah, I think the ideal one would... Um... Either be, I would say, you know, when you're looking at Dizazia, I think you're not just looking as a backup to Wesley Fofana. You actually want somebody to be able to compete. And when you look at the skill sets, I think Wes is a better carrier of the ball, but uh, Dizazia is a better passer. I think that's um, the major difference between them both. So I think there is a, a ideal universe where both of them are pushing each other and uh, you're able to get. You know, with the injuries that Wes has had, you're able to also rest him, rotate him comfortably without letting a drop in quality happen. And um, like you said, um, one of the questions that unfortunately didn't make the pod because we we were afraid of like running out of time, but you mentioned an excellent point about um, can he be used as a tactical option at right back instead of having somebody like a Gusto or a Reese James who's, you know, who who love bombing forward and who love delivering into the box just having somebody who's able to seal down that right flank and allow somebody like a Madueke more defensive security, somebody who's able to turn a back two into a back three by just slotting it at right center back, making the defense rest defense more secure and allowing others to do their job. I think Disasi is somebody who, who arguably will be able to offer that tactical option as well. Somebody, if you're coming up against a Vinicius and God forbid you don't have... Um, somebody like a Reese James fit, then I would, instead of a Malo Gusto, from, on the basis of what I've seen at Lyon, I would say that it would be wiser to put Disasi in there and figure out what we can do. So uh, hopefully that's a tactical option, irrespective of what happens when Vespafana is back. And uh, with Ugochuku, I would say that the ideal situation would be to, to give him a very fruitful loan. I don't know if it happens at Strasbourg. Um, I don't know if it happens elsewhere, but arguably 30, 35 games at the top level where he's playing week in, week out, not playing 50 minutes, not playing 75 minutes, playing 90s over and over again in a side that isn't dysfunctional and gives him the chance to develop the kind of uh, skill sets that he's showing promise in, but isn't consistently showing enough. So um, I did, you would want to see those glimpses turn into 25, 30 minute spells, then 60 minute spells, and then entire performances. So Hopefully he comes back and and has about 10 good performances under his belt, which makes Pochettino absolutely want to see him in preseason next season. So I think um, that would be my assessment in terms of a fair, good assessment of both players. 
What about you, Ali? Would you agree? Would you differ? No, I think I think that's a completely fair uh, take. Um, and I th- I think it's a it's it's a nice way to to kind of go with it. To be honest, um, I think you've we've given the listeners a fair rundown of both players, their strengths, uh, their weaknesses, where we'd like them to go. Um, so yeah, thanks as always, Sam. And I think next time, hopefully we have a bit more of an Ecuadorian flavour on our transfer profiles, eh? <laughs> And both of us, both of us have a, a fairly good grasp on Spanish as well. So we should definitely come with some new vocabulary, add a beautiful, nice, uh, educative element to the Londoners Blue Pod for our lovely listeners. I think that is something that I will definitely look forward to with you, Oli. So thank you so much for for giving me company in my jet lagged hours and um, having me talk about some nice football. I think that just takes a lot of the edge away. So as always, very grateful for your company. No worries, Sam. So yeah, thanks for listening. And as always, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.